which one which one uh this one does does okay 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 maybe we can get started they they reorganized this room so it feels completely different now the way it's set up i don't know i liked it better with the u i don't know why it is the way it is well welcome i'm sue Braley, in case you don't know me um hi <laughs> um, uh, this is what we do every fall to kind of bring us all back together after the summer and remind ourselves what we're doing. I think because we're still on the cusp of getting an RFP from NSF, we'll also talk about uh, renewal and that sort of thing. So I thought I would just jump in and then we'll start um, uh, introducing people throughout the rest of the time, or should we just go around the room right now? Maybe it'd be better to do it right now. What do you think, Jason? What do you think, Jason? Do it now, Ken? Okay. Um, all right, so the overall hypothesis of what we're doing, just to bring our everybody's heads around it, is projecting critical zone evolution into the future. And basically, we think we have to know about the geology of the system in the past, observations today, and then we can predict into the future. So there's a huge number of people involved on this. Um, if, if you don't see your name up here, tell us, or better yet, tell Jennifer, and uh, we'll try to get people's names on there. Lots and lots of people have worked with us over the, over the years, and we try to keep up with it, but we're imperfect human beings. Um, I'm not sure if we got the new student's name on there, uh, that's that's now over an ag. I don't know you, both of the, okay. So you're on there twice, Jason. John. Oh, John Duncan. Okay. Um, well, why don't we do those new people? Why don't you introduce your two stu students, and we'll try to find them up here. Go ahead. Sure. Okay. Caitlin Hodges. Caitlin Hodges. Hey. Okay, welcome, Kaylin. Which one is Ben? Oh, Ben. <laughs> so your names are up here somewhere. Yeah, you st everybody stresses our system. I stress our system because all the slides come in the very last possible moment. And then Dave has a. What's your last name, Malik? Yeah. Welcome, Andy. Okay. And then John Duncan's also up here, but I think we've introduced, everybody's met John before. Okay. Is there anybody else that's new in the room that I should introduce? This is a bad weekend to be out of time. She's missing our field trip and this thing. Oh, well, it happens. Okay, so we're trying to measure and model the system across time scales from meteorologist to geologist. We'd like to project forward. We call that earth casting. And one of our goals is to provide a really good educational experience for grad students, undergrads, faculty, non-faculty, citizens. I mean, we really cast it broadly. Um, and uh, I just threw a couple slides in the beginning. This, this, I didn't quite know what to do in here because really this is the tail end if we're not gonna get renewed. And yet we're thinking that we have a really good chance of being renewed, but we haven't seen the RFP yet. So it's kind of a general overview and then looking to the future and trying to tell you things that I've learned, um, at, especially at the meeting I was just at last week at, out in California at the Eel River CZO. So, kind of one of our big picture things that we've been thinking about is our first years we spent on shale hills and we measured every tree we meaning dave eisenstadt and his students measured every tree and labeled them all and we've got little wells all over piezometers all over soil moisture we sort of call that measuring everything everywhere so we know a lot about a very small area and then how, how do you take that kind of knowledge and, and make broader um, 
models and broader understanding. So we kind of have been articulating this idea, well, we don't really need to measure all of those things. We do if we want to know everything, but if we want to try to scale up and do sort of a broader, more regional model, we've, we have a smaller set of data that we're now collecting at Shale Hills. And we articulated this idea of the groundhog where we've got um, soil pits on either side of the watershed, but then we also have soil pits at the ridge top, mid slope, and at, at the valley. And then we've started taking that distribution, which we call groundhog, and we now have implemented it at another watershed, namely Garner Run. So Shale Hills is a little tiny watershed down here, and now we are also working in Garner Run, which is underlain by a different rock type, namely sandstone. Shale Hills, shale, this one's sandstone, and we have a groundhog distribution that we've put in Garner Run, and we're trying to compare measurements here and there and also try to make models for both of the, the different sites. The overall idea would be that we could actually extrapolate to all of the Shavers Creek watershed, which is what's shown here, different geologic types, so these are different rock types. And so the idea was if we knew about shale from Shale Hills, sandstone from Garner Run, and then if we had one more site and the other site we have now chosen, which is the Coal Farm site, it's on a different kind of shale, a calcareous shale, so it's got a lot more calcite in it, and it's farmed, that with the information about those little sites, we would be able to start to scale up uh, the Shavers Creek. So you'll hear a little bit about that later with the, with the um, students' talks. But that's exactly what we've been doing. We've been really learning a lot about Garner Run. We're still getting data from Shale Hills, and then we've just started getting data from Coal Farm, so we've really just gotten our feet wet in that respect. Here's how we're organized. Um, there's a picture of these guys coming next, and we'll talk a little bit about this. This is me down here. The students are really everything, and uh, that's why you're getting most of this talk today. Here's the executive committee. This person rotates in and out, but currently it's Jason. We always have a student as well. Is you Ting here? I didn't see you Ting. Oh, she's in Oxford. Oh, that's nice. All right. Well, um, we always have a student, and, and that voice is important as well. Um, okay. We always have an advisory committee, but we bring them in and then we don't utilize them as much as you'd expect. Okay, so at all hands in 2018, which will be, here's the dates, May 10 and May 11, we will invite someone and the, the question of whom to invite is still open. Um, these are the people who we've ha invited in the past. They come in, they spend the whole weekend with us, they really uh, interact with us quite a bit. And then we consider them at our advisory committee, but we haven't actually utilized them very much. This is something that, you know, we could do. We could go back to them and ask them to come back or something like that. But you can see who they are. You can think about whom you'd like to have um, come in for this spring. Because usually the person that comes in really does help us quite a bit. Uh, here's the support staff. Jennifer pretty much tries to run everything and keep us all organized. Um, she's also uh, hands-on with uh, geochemical sample and sample data. Brandon tries to keep the watershed operating. He's actually on a family vacation, much deserved this week. And then Dan, Danny Shapich, um, he's the data manager, and then he also does a little, some AV and things in the web organization with us and that sort of thing. So this is where all the data comes. Once it comes in from the field site, uh, Brandon's really trying to keep the field site running, and then Jennifer's obviously keeping us organized to the extent we can. Here's some of the names of grad students that have been supported over the years. Um, here's the current crop, as best we know, of people that were funded, or are funded right now, if your name isn't up there and you're getting funded. <laughs> Some of these people may not be currently getting funded right now, but may be working on the project, too. Um, it's a little, these are just the ones that are funded, okay. It's actually hard to keep track of everything. Um, and so you can see we, do, we have a lot of people that, are, that go through our program. We're also always working on outreach, and for a long time we've worked with a high school group, and uh, Jennifer spearheads this, I work on it. Uh, they go out and sample water, and um, actually have had a great experience. They've gone to the Geological Society of America, they did a poster, they present usually at one of our meetings, um, and that has not ramped up this year, but if you're interested in that, that's actually a really fun thing to do. And then our most recent thing has been trying to work with Shavers Creek Environmental Center, to try to get the critical zone science concept into the, into the new museum 
and designing a, a walk around the uh, environmental center. And then we have some social media things that we've been working on. Okay, we're also part of a network, and uh, here's our CZO here, but there's nine CZOs around the country, and the National Science Foundation funds us, and they want us to be more of a network, and they want, not only at each observatory, do they want you know, cross-disciplinary science to happen, but they want there to be cross-network science happening. And they've been really pushing this. And so that's something that the network teams have really been trying to get to happen. And that's something that you all should be thinking about and hopefully uh, promoting. Well, that's because Henna's and Santa Catalina is one CZO, but they're split into geologic locations. <laughs> you thought you caught me. You thought you caught me. <laughs> Everything's complicated. Um, We've spent times articulating, you know, what it is we're trying to do. This is like one of the articulations. I have a lot of slides in here like this just to try to show you, you know, what this RFP is going to look like. Nobody knows. An RFP is a request for proposals in case there's anybody that doesn't know that. You know, we've got funded, I think, almost three times in a row. And we hope to keep being funded for the next five years. But the way we'll be funded is there'll be a request for proposals that comes out it will have verbiage that we try to show that we can do that science and do it better than anybody else. Um, so I've got a lot of slides in here like this to kind of talk about what we're trying to do. This is what the network thinks of as our core values and what we're trying to do. I'm also very aware we have new students in the room that are trying to figure out what piece of the project they want to work on. So I wanted you to see it in terms of the big picture. We really, you know, focus on cross-discipline. We hope every student comes out of here being able to cross-discipline. Um, integrative, uh, NSF was really big on transformative science. Now they're very big at, um, oh my gosh, the, the phrase just jumped out of my head. Oh. No, it's um, convergent science. <laughs> So, so I know, they used to always be pushing transformative science where you're transforming the world, transforming the science. Now what they're pushing is convergent science, which I think nobody really knows what it means. But what, what I think it means is when, you know, Roman and I look at the, the, different, the same thing in the field, but we look at it from different disciplines. You know, he looks at it as a geomorphologist, I look at it as a geochemist, and we realize that we're seeing the same thing, you know, that we can pull the different strands together. And if anyone is doing convergent science, it is critical zone observatories. I mean, each of you are working together across disciplines, the students in particular. Dave and I still have trouble being able to communicate sometimes, you know. But the students, yeah, it's not well. But the students can, are really crossing. And I think that's, that's exactly what NSF wants to see. And the RFP will probably have something in there about convergent science. Um, working together as an open community. Um, we, we definitely press this as critical zone science that we go across all time scales, especially back to geologic time, which means we have to go deeper into the earth than your average, say, soil science or catchment scientists would have. And then we wanna look at linkages and how things are coupled together. And we always wanna be able to be quantitative and be able to predict. Uh, again, you know, these are, we just published a paper in Earth Surface Dynamics that um, this is a, sort of like a manifesto about what the future network of observatories should look like. And uh, you can see this is, you know, kind of the verbiage that we came up with that there's three uh, surfaces, this sort of upper surface, the top of canopy, the land surface, and then this deeper surface, which is, you know, sort of like the groundwater surface, the unweathered uh, groundwater surface at the bottom. And that the understanding of critical zone science is how do those three different surfaces kind of, um, how are they coupled together? Uh, we argued a lot about what are the three emergent ideas that have come out. And, you know, I have other ones in this talk because depending on who writes them down, they write them in different ways. But just to give you a flavor of it, for the first time, we've obtained observations that reveal how the deep surface of the critical zone varies across landscapes. This is the idea that now we have geophysical data, geophysical observations that are also um, co-located with wells drilling so that we can actually say something about the structure and what, what controls that structure. 
and we now have mechanistic models for how regolith forms and what controls the structures. And then this is the idea that uh, a lot of people here have thought about, which is how does the information from the top that's percolating or you know, infiltrating into the surface, how does that affect uh, material properties and function deeper? And then how does the processes deeper, actually how does that information get up and how does it uh, sort of talk to, this, to the surface? So just as an example, in Yale River last week, which is in Northern California, they spent a lot of time talking about which trees were growing in which lithologies and why. So which rock types you know, were good hosts for which trees. And then they were able to look at how those trees used water. And then they could show there was more tree death in the recent drought for particular trees on particular lithologies. And they were able to tie sort of the rock type to the water, to the drought, to the tree species. And then they were able to make some predictions about things like, well, now that humans are suppressing fire and the Douglas fir is starting to move in across the landscape, well, you know, the Doug fir isn't as good in drought situations and, and they could relate that to the lithology. So it's very convergent. It's bringing an eco-hydrologist together, tree physiologists together, geologists together. And that kind of thing, I think, is what is going to be what wins the proposal that we, you know, ultimately is pulling those kinds of threads together. Um, there was a paper that was published, uh, which I didn't apparently cite on here, that talked about different models for regolith formation. This is, this is one of the things that people see CZ science as having really advanced. Um, quantitative models of what, what has created regolith in soil. And, you know, yeah, I started to, okay, so different people define it differently, of course. The way I'm using the term regolith is anything um, that is altered or weathered that is on top of bedrock. Is that okay? All right. So there's, a, there's arguments that you know, there is controls from the bottom, like groundwater controls on how it forms. And then there's arguments about it's being controlled from the top down, from, you know, rainfall, climate kinds of issues, vegetation, biota, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and then there's, there's, a, there's a recent paper about lateral flow. So there's sort of like a top down model, a bottom up model with a lateral flow model. And, uh, Lots of interest in this. This is definitely something that's really associated with critical zone sciences. How does soil form? How does regolith form? One of the people who has pushed uh, one of the models that's gotten a lot of attention is Daniela Rempe. She's visiting Penn State October 31st. She's going to be in the geosciences department, so you'll see that, and that's kind of a nice opportunity. Um, she did her PhD at the Eel River CZO and is now a professor at University of Texas, Austin. And as I said, I was just at Eel River. Um, where is Jin Gu? He's not here, is he? Oh, so he was out there with me. And it was a great visit. Um, the Eel River CZO is, is largely on shale. And it's a very fast eroding site, high, wet, high uh, rainfall site, uh, sort of tectonically active site. Very nice parallel to shale hills. So, I mean, I, I think that could be an asset to us as we go forward in terms of a, of a proposal as well. Um, there is going to be a cross-network webinar coming up that is going to kind of look at, you know, some of these processes. Uh, as I understand it, they haven't announced the dates or the speakers or anything. There's going to be one that's going to be like top-down formation of regolith and soil versus the bottom-up formation of regolith and soil. And the second one is going to be about um, fast versus slow processes. How, you know, how do you model a system that has very slow geologic processes at the same time it has very fast sort of meteorological processes? Like what do you need to know about those two time scales and, and how do you bring those together? Uh, another little point, if there's anyone in the room that's interested in this conference, this is the geochemistry conference, International Geochemistry Conference. It'll be in Boston next year. By November 1, they are looking for proposals for, for topics. And so, you know, so one of these two topics might be a really good sort of geochemical 
uh, thing to propose if there was someone interested in that. There's been a big focus also on hydrologic partitioning. So rainfall goes into a system and then it, water goes out as a stream. And hydrologic partitioning is, you know, how much of it goes back in evaporation, how much goes as surface runoff, how much goes as shallow flow, how much goes as deep flow. That's what hydrologic partitioning is. And we would like to be able to predict it anywhere in the globe from first principles and we can't do it. So the idea is, well, a lot of that partitioning is related to the structure of the critical zone. So the structure of regolith, you know, what's in the subsurface. So if we know something about this subsurface, can we predict hydrologic partitioning? Well, the answer is yes, but you know, how do we, how do we get better at it? The network has hired a postdoc to look at this idea across all the CZOs and also to pull the data out of all the CZOs to check if our data is usable, efficient, you know, present, et cetera. And so this has been going on for six months. We hired uh, the postdoc, his name is coming up, and I, and I don't know how to say his name, so you'll see it when it comes up. Um, these are the two questions he's been struggling, he's been taught, you know, thinking about, and I just sort of tried to describe. He's going to try to look at it with sort of what I would call a conceptual model. He calls it a perceptual model, and then a look for quantitative signatures. And these are the data sets that he's pulled from each CZO. And uh, here we are down here, so we get all good check marks. I'm not really sure why, why some of the CZOs don't, don't have you know, discharge data and precip data and meteorological data. Um, but one of the intents of hiring this postdoc was to, to look across all the data sets and see, can you find it? You know, is it easy to pull? And then to give us feedback. And that's why we were counting on you to make sure that, you know, whatever feedback we got from him that you've got to implement. He's starting to make plots to be able to compare, uh, you know, attributes of these data across the CZOs. So here's his name, Adam. Does anyone know how to say his name? Lestowski? I don't know whether to pronounce the W or the L. He's, he's, he's been great. He's been absolutely fabulous. He works with Kieran Harmon, who's at Hopkins, and Noah Malach at um, UC Boulder. So this is the different CZOs you can see we're here. And this is median flux versus time, in essence. And you can read a little bit more about it uh, here. And they've got discharge, precip, and potential evapotranspiration. Uh, they did a really simple thing. This is called a Badico plot. Is that right? I don't know as much about this. Ken might be able to tell you more. This is the evaporation uh, ratio. So evaporation to precip versus the aridity index. And I'm not sure I can tell you too much about the aridity index. Is that something you can explain to anybody in the room? Ken, I don't want to put you on the spot. OK. So this is how much you'd expect. Right, right. And you can see how, how we plot out across here. And I think, you know, the idea is to be able to sort of understand, you know, why it looks like this and, you know, why do some, some of these fall off the plot? I don't know which one that is, SC. That's Santa Catalina. We are right here. So we're basically on the plot. And then here is uh, storage minus discharge relationships. So this is discharge versus S minus S zero. This is relative storage. Can anybody help me on that? I just got this like yesterday. Relative storage measure, the total range of dynamic storage in each catchment. So this is the total storage in the catchment. I guess that's just the... And so the idea is like, why do these different plots look different in the most simple, simple uh, rendition? He's been working on this for five months and, you know, he's going to come visit, I think, in June. Do you remember? Do you know? Okay. Um, just, I just tried to get as much information as I could of it in these slides. Next week, Pam Sullivan will be here. <laughs> and she's talking to us right now. <laughs> It's the amount of dynamic storage in the system, I think is what she wants to say. Um, okay, Pam's gonna be here next week. So will Jenny Duhan. Jenny Duhan is a um, isotope geochemist and uh, she works at the Eel River. She's a professor in Indiana, I think. Illinois University, University of Illinois. Um, 
We also have a delegation of Chinese scientists from, from the Geological Survey, I think. Henry, do you remember where they're from? Yeah, from the Geologic Survey. Okay, and it'll be just at the end of October. That's the same time that Daniela Rempe is gonna be here. Uh, then Rick Hooper is visiting us. He's a hydrologist that's interested in same kinds of hydraulic partitioning kinds of things. And then Bill Ball is visiting um, November 30. And December 1st. And how would you describe him? Like what is his area? <laughs> the director of the Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so this is sort of a big area of uh, I'm not going forward for some reason. Okay, um, data management. I just stuck this in here to remind you that we always have to be given data to Dan and. You know, whether we get funded or not could be partly based on whether we have good data sets up online. This is just a whole list of models that um, have been used at the CZS. I'm really not going to go over them at all. Other than to say that the one that we've worked quite a bit on, uh, PIM, is one that um, has had a lot of impact, has been used at other sites. We have many modules that have been developed between Chris Duffy, Armin, uh, Ken Davis, Yuning Shi, who's been really big, the big push, and Li Li, and uh, we've actually been encouraging them to think of some kind of workshop or something to teach people about, about PIN as well. Um, these are some of the cross-site hypotheses that have been proposed. Um, you know, it's possible that the network would get organized enough to have a couple of hypotheses that would be decided upon that everyone would have to address in the renewal. But so far, I haven't heard one. These are, these are hypotheses that have been around, that, you know, that have been bumped around and, and discussed. I, pr I tried to put some names, but I'm sure I haven't put everybody's names on here that I could put up here that could be thought of as working on some of these um, different topics. Um, the one that I think we've been perhaps the weakest on is things about microbial community, because we really haven't had a microbiologist work at our site. Uh, recently, Eric Roden was here, and his, uh, is she a grad student or a postdoc? I think she's a grad student. Um, they've actually put some samples down in our wells, and then they're gonna come back and take them out and harvest the microbes. So we're, we actually do have uh, somebody starting to work on this, but we really haven't done a lot of microbiology. Um, I think some of these other uh, hypotheses, we do have a fair amount of people working on. But again, there has been no cross-network decision of a hypothesis that we know now that we could be aiming at. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a moving target. Um, what might the future network look like? The, the push that we're making is that we should have CZOs around the country, but that there should also be um, kind of a hybrid where some CZOs might you know, have some spokes coming off of it with satellite sites or something. Um, it's really not clear to me what NSF is going to do, like what they, what they want it to look like. If I had to guess, I would guess they will fund some CZOs. Uh, they won't fund all nine of the CZOs into the future. They'll fund a subset of those and they'll pick some new CZOs. That's my guess of what they'll do. And they will put money on the table for small PI grants to work at CZOs. That's my guess of what's gonna happen. But I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen the RFP. Nobody's told me what it's gonna be. I could be totally wrong. We talked about this at the June meeting in 2017, and there's a white paper being written about it that Pam Sullivan has been spearheading with uh, um, several other people, and uh, I would say that that will be given to NSF within the month. NSF has said that they won't put an RFP out until they see the white paper. So, you know, I think they're writing the RFP now because otherwise, you know, it would be a really long time before an RFP came out. But um, NSF has seen the white paper in draft form. And so I think sometime in the next couple months, we'll see an RFP. And the white paper, I've already seen it, um, but I think it'll probably go out for public comment pretty soon, because it hasn't really been out for public comment. Um, 
So where are we going? Uh, this is what I just said. Pam and Bill McDowell are leading the white paper. By the way, I know I talked to Ken a lot about he thought that the white paper should be vetted publicly. I thought so too, but they haven't really done that. So I mean, I, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, I do know that they are going to be seeking some feedback on it at some point, but in the next couple of weeks, maybe. Uh, I think I told you all this up here. Oh, there was some feedback because the NSF has seen a draft of the white paper, the document that came out of the Arlington meeting. There, the NSF came back and they said that they would like to see either more detail or more emphasis. I think I shouldn't have said more emphasis. I think they just wanted more detail about the possibility of a karst CZO and or the possibility of an urban CZO. So there's interest on the part of NSF in those two items. Does that mean that's the only thing they're going to fund? I, I, I don't think so, but there, there has been some expressed interest. So I don't know, where are we going? You know, we still have to go through that conversation, but we've been kind of waiting for the RFP to know what exactly they're looking for. We have talked about this. What are the response times to disturbance for the critical zone? You know, this was seemed to be an idea that everybody kind of resonated with because it gets at this long and short time scale thing. You know, some of us are interested in more short time scales, some in long time scales, but all the different processes affect one another. And I think this is kind of an idea that we might be able to rally behind. Uh, NSF is really pushing, we need junior scientists to come, you know, to really be first and foremost. And so one of the ideas that I've been wondering in my head is would there be some way to, to bring more junior scientists into our CZO, um, perhaps even from outside of Penn State. Um, so that's just something that it seems to me would help us get refunded. And I'm all about doing better science and more science. And the only way you can do that typically is for some funding, yeah. Um, if you're interested in microbiology, um, we've got several microbiome type people hired. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might, I mean, it might be good. I mean, I, we just have to think about how we're going to do it. Um, honestly, I think, you know, PIM has been a real asset. I mean, the, the, those of you that are working on PIM, I mean, there's been some real good contributions made, and I like the modules that have been made and how it's all been working together. I think it would be really good to use it at other CZOs and to maybe run a workshop to get it out there. So you know, that's something we've talked about, but I think that would be a positive. Um, maybe it's because I was just at Eel River last, this past weekend, but I think we have a lot of affinity with that CZO. It's a shale, it's a high erosion site. There's really nice kind of parallels. Um, Todd Dawson. Yeah, Todd Dawson. And they had a lot on there about, you know, what kind of water that different trees were, were using and um, which ones were getting you know, hurt by the fire suppression, which ones were getting hurt by the drought. And I thought the work that you've been doing, Dave, on the sandstone, I mean, the, um, you know, the different trees on, on the Tuscarora sandstone, we should probably develop that and get that out there. I, mean, I know you've been working in that direction um, because there'd be some parallels there, um, some interesting parallels. And maybe we should pr promote collaboration. Maybe they wouldn't want it. Maybe they would. I don't know. But I think there, there's, there's, there's a fair number of things that would make a good, a good uh, cross-site push. Um, I've said all of these things. They also go all the way from upland to estuary, which we don't do. Um, but, you know, it has occurred to me, you know, should we just, you know, bite the bullet and make a CZO that's really big and bring in Karst and Urban, you know, go all the way to Baltimore and maybe bring in the Baltimore LTR. I don't know, like, maybe that's a totally crazy idea. I have no idea. Um, but certainly we have Karst, you know, in the Susquehanna right here. So we could do Karst too. I don't know. Uh, I've already said something about convergence science. I mean, ultimately for everybody in the room and for the students that don't understand how NSF works, the, it's always like this. You never know what's coming down the pike. You never know where you're going. All you can do is publish, engage, do the best science you can possibly do. You know what I mean? And as long as you're doing really good science, then you're really safeguarding yourself for the, for the best. So, you know, anyway. Okay, so that was kind of my like overview. Then I thought what we'd do is just go student to student and do like, did we say one or two minutes? Two minutes. 
And so then we'll have like a quick, quick couple of questions. So this is, you know, this is a new thing to be able to do a lightning talk. You're actually seeing this at conferences more and more. So, you know, this is your chance to show who you are, what you're doing, and what you want to do, okay? And however you package it, it'll be just fine. But I don't want to do the timing, so who wants to do the timing? Who's going to do the timing for me? Somebody? You'll do it? Jason? Okay, that'd be great. So, who's, who's first? Oh, here, here's, I labeled them all. Remember, we did, we, we, we broke ourselves into hypothesis teams, so kind of ostensibly every student has a hypothesis team, but you, you aren't necessarily talking to your hypothesis. Although at the end of the day, when we go in for renewal, we will have to revisit our hypothesis and see how far we've gotten. Okay, so who, do we, do we know who's first? Joan Marie is still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi. Um, hello, new people. I'm Joan Marie. Um, I don't. I sure. Okay. Because you got a laser. Uh, hello. Okay. So I'm Joan Marie. It says Joan Marie is still here because I successfully defended my master's thesis in May, which is this work. Um, but I'm still here because I'm uh, sticking around doing a PhD. Got too curious. Uh, we'll learn more later. Okay. So. Um, this is my update. So on the left, um, I'm showing you some figures from um, one of the papers that came out from my master's work with Roman, uh, Roman Dibiase right here. Um, so this was work that we did in collaboration with the folks at University of Vermont in the Cosmogenic Lab. And so basically this study was a synthesis of um, field mapping of the regolith, um, the boulderiness of the soils. We used um, high resolution LIDAR mapping as well as um, the accumulation of cosmogenic nuclides at the surface and in the core that we recovered from the valley fill in order to figure out what sorts of erosion mechanisms are dominant in this landscape. And one of the more interesting um, outcomes of this study was that both the regolith and the debris in the valley fill date to pre before the last glacial maximum, even as far back as maybe 350,000 years ago, um, which is which we dated in the Valley Phil. So that was very cool. We've submitted that to GSA Bulletin. It's in review. Um, the second sort of half of the work I did with my master's, which is wrapping up um, right now, we're throwing together this paper, um, Roman spearheading that. But this is um, combining the work of a lot of geophysical data sets um, synthesizing those data sets as well with um, the surface and geomorphic observations. And what I'm showing here is um, a couple of the uh, geophysical data sets. And then what I'm showing is a sort of like cartoon interpretation you can make if you combine all these data sets to tell a geologic story. Um, that's at the bottom there. So Roman and I are really interested in finding more of these sort of paleo erosion records, maybe buried in other sort of headwater valleys in central Appalachia, considering how far back the record at Garner Run went, it would be interesting to look across central Appalachia and there might be possibility of finding sort of information about the soils and climate as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, goodness. Sorry. I'm... Hi, Greg. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to look for... Yeah, yeah, I was, I was uh, talking, <laughs> smiley face to you. Okay, um, yeah, so maybe, maybe if we drill more, um, we'll find more cool stuff there. Thank you. Okay, uh, what, one more, back. there we go, okay. Hi, um, I'm Kaylin Hodges. I am Jason Kay's new grad student. Um, I did my master's at the University of Georgia with Aaron Thompson, um, working on the Calhoun Cesio. So introducing a little bit of my previous research and then maybe how that research will 
kind of get into the shale hills. So um, I was interested in characterizing iron reduction potential across the landscapes at the Calhoun, and I used these rusted steel rods that are 90 centimeters long. Um, I installed them across the uh, four water, or three watersheds at the Calhoun for two weeks, and then after two weeks, I can take them off, and if the rust is gone, that means that iron reduction is happening because that rust is a really easily reducible iron-free mineral. Um, the maps in the top right-hand corner are my results from October and March, uh, October 2015 and March 2016. So in October of 2015, I installed them about five days after a 25 centimeter rainfall event and found that iron reduction, so blue, I don't know why it's blocked out, uh, the, okay, yeah, I got it. So the, for whatever reason, this is blacked out. So the cool colors indicate high potential for iron reduction. And then this warm color indicates low potential for iron reduction. So in October 2015, we found a lot of iron reduction potential at the base of the soil profile. And then in March, we found the opposite. So March was right before leaf out when there's a lot of label carbon around. And all of that iron potential for iron reduction was at the top of the soil profile, indicating that both soil moisture and carbon availability are important for reduce or for uh, iron reduction potential. So kind of getting into what this might work with the Shell Hills, um, how do iron minerals and iron respiration impact nutrient transport and retention across the landscapes, the different landscapes at Shell Hills? And then also what is the role of water held at different uh, water or potentials um, in transformation and transport of iron and nutrients in the Shell Hills? Okay, I, yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> So iron respiration, so like microbes using iron as a terminal electron acceptor instead of oxygen. Hi, my name. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Rondi Malik. Um, my background in undergrad was population genetics, invasive weeds. Um, as a master's student at Indiana, I worked on mycorrhizal ecology at Indiana University with Jim Beaver. And now I'm here working with Dave Eisenstadt. And here's a project that I had um, worked on in the last year. Here um, in the top left um, quadrant, what you're seeing is a projected shift in um, oak and maple ranges. So you can't really see none of the words down here, but just know that the red is um, maple birch ranges, which is now in the year 2000. And this is in about the year 2100 that you're seeing that the projected um, change in range due to climate change will predominantly be oak, oak in hickory forests. So what I did was I wanted to know how did maple and oak root affect decomposition of recalcitrant litter, which was wood. And what I did was I restricted root exposure to the um, woody debris. So the roots influence the micro microbial community known as the, known as the rhizosphere. What you see is that in the absence of root exposure, there is less, um, there is less colonization by the saprotrophs, which are um, leading to wood degradation. Here, we're seeing that predominantly the black is where there's dense colonization, and that's happening on maple plush roots treatment, which, which indicates scavenging by ectomycorrhizal fungi because these um, roots associated with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And here's the uh, here's me quantifying decomposition. And so the ANOVA is, is marginally significant, 0 .0, 0.6. But when we do contrast, we see that there's significant decomposition on maple soils in contrast to oak soils. And that's it. Um, this is at the critical zone. Um, common Garden in Hartley Woods. So um, this is a representative of all the data together. We get more power that way. Okay. 
hey, there were supposed to be animations, but I guess they failed. But that's okay. Um, so I'm Ismail Zink. I'm a PhD candidate student um, in, in uh, working with, with Dave Eisenstadt and Sue Brantley. Um, yeah, no, that, that, it was supposed to show one graph and then the other graph, so sorry. Um, so um, I'm looking predominantly at uh, trees and biogeochemistry within the, 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 the critical zone. So um, this first graph that I'm showing right here is uh, the SAPFLEX data that we've been collecting for several years. Um, and so we start out with this raw data and it's just pretty much a voltage difference between two probes. And then through a math miracle, we get this uh, nice graph that shows us how much uh, water is being moved through the trunks of the trees. And so as Sue said before, you know, if we're really interested in how trees are using water, this is a good way to look at um, this. We have four trees at Shell Hills doing this and four trees at Garner Run. So we can kind of see if lithology is playing an important part because, you know, the uh, sandstone site has much sandier soil, so it doesn't have as high of water holding capacity. Uh, so it might be more affected by drought or by a rain event um, in, in how trees are using that water. Um, and then the one in the back, which you can't really see, um, was just a schematic of, of how I'm planning on looking at uh, root exudates. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to start that probably next summer. And, but this fall and winter, I'm going to be probably uh, learning how, how to do these protocols in a greenhouse system and then moving that to shale hills. Um, so yeah, thanks. Um, I don't think we have dendro bands around the, the, the trees that we have the, the sap flex on, but we do have dendro bands on trees, um, on, on other trees around the, the site. So um, we could try and like extrapolate this to how the entire watershed is using water and how, yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, we don't have those, sorry. Okay. Yeah, so so I guess we can only look at annual growth. Hi, uh, my name is Chi Chen. I'm from Henry's group, and today I'm going to talk my uh, synthesize my manuscript under hypothesis four that comparing preferential flow between the shell hairs and the gun run. And what I'm going to do for the next step, uh, working with Li Guo and Henry. Uh, first off, uh, like I introduced you, like I compare preferential flow between the shell hairs and gun run, and then we found more precipitation that create uh, more preferential flow at the shell hairs. Uh, and the second is uh, different uh, uh, store depths have different preferential flow frequency. This uh, can tell us that different root distribution between the shale hairs and the gun run create different so preferential flow frequency at different depths. And third, uh, different initial wetness between the shale hairs and the gun run uh, create different preferential flow patterns, like drier soil at the shale hairs and wetter soil at the gun run are more easily to create preferential flow. Lastly, because the topography is different between the shell hairs and the gun run. So the soil water storage pattern are also different uh, between the shell hairs and the gun run. So for now, uh, this tells us a story that the preferential flow is truly determined by a lot of factors. They work together to create this complex pattern. So uh, these are all talked at the pattern scale. For my next step, I will work with uh, like the geophysics tool and so moisture sensors to link uh, different patterns to upscale to the hair slope scale and to model the complex subsurface flow networks at the hair slope scale. Uh, I, I, my plan is to describe specific characteristics of the preferential flow like a self-organization characteristic. Thank you. Yeah, like 
my presentation and the last one. Right? I update the form. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we. Yeah, yeah. I found that a dryer saw at shear gears creates more unsequential flow at the shear gears. Uh, unsequential. We use the non-sequential sewing moisture sensor response. Like we have three depth sensor. If they response unsequentially, we create that. Yeah. Nineteenth. Okay, I Uh, hello, I'm Da Cheng, um, a PhD candidate working with Dr. Lee uh, in Yunnan and uh, Su. Um, for hypothesis five, our primary goal is to, um, uh, from the modeling perspective, understand uh, why there will be the difference uh, in the uh, chemical depletion, the water behavior, and the uh, rapid steps on two aspects of the watershed. We developed a, a rapid formation model for a two-dimensional hill slope. In the model, we start from the homogeneous bedrock with the initial minerals of the um, quartz, elite, fluorite, uh, pyrite, and carbonate. Due to the reactive transfer uh, processes, there will be uh, the process change, the uh, permeability, the flow field of, of uh, flow field, and also the mineral um, uh, composition change over time. Uh, we implemented different water flow rate uh, on two aspects, and after a thousand years simulation, uh, we notice there will be an asymmetric flow field and the permeability pattern on two aspects. Uh, and uh, from the uh, uh, mass transfer coefficient, uh, the dissolution of elite and chloride contributes a lot to this kind of pattern of the top fracture pattern layer. Um, we also found that the larger water flow rate at the north facing aspect enhances the chemical weathering and further generates the deeper rapid steps. In the future, uh, we are going to uh, consider the gas dynamics and uh, in to the system, and also uh, consider the uh, minerals and factors to figure out more uh, potential methods. Uh, in in our model, we uh, actually didn't use the same river um, river stage to constrain both sides. We we are consider them as different outside because we gave different flow rate and let them have different outside. Uh, and yeah, show hills have if you consider water. All right, well, sometimes sometimes this is what happens. All right, hi everybody, uh, I'm Callum. Uh, I'm being advised by Sue and I also work with John Duncan and Lee Lee. Callum Wayman, uh, there you go. All right, well.
We're really digging into my two minutes. <laughs> got a lot of got a lot of jokers in the room. Okay. Uh, okay. Awesome. Uh, well, wow. Um, so I had three figures, but we'll just talk about one. Um, so my current question that I'm talking about is: uh, Can coal farm be used as an analog? for understanding water and nutrient transport uh, in the larger agriculturally developed portion of Shaver Creek watershed. Um, so something that, I'm, uh, something that I'm kind of talking about right now is the fact that coal farm is underlain by a very similar lithology that the rest of the agricultural part of Shaver Creek watershed is underlain by. And so basically my question right now is, is the lithology, which is so similar throughout all the agriculture and also at coal farm, um, a major control on potential nutrient transport like nitrate transport um, from the fields where they're being uh, fertilized into Shavers Creek. Um, and the reason I think we can use coal farm as an analog is because we have this spring uh, in the middle of coal farm that flows from the hill slopes. Um, it sort of comes out in this tree area here. You see I have spring outflow written right here. The spring sort of appears and then it flows into this pond. Um, and at first I was sort of thinking, well, this, this spring is... Uh, you know, it would be nice if it was flowing directly into Shavers Creek so I could know if the fields were having some sort of, field fertilization was having some sort of impact on Shavers Creek uh, chemistry. But now I'm sort of thinking maybe we can use the spring as sort of like a, like a discharge uh, analog uh, at the farm, right? And we say, okay, maybe the spring is like where um, the water's being discharged from this small catchment into the pond and we can measure uh, nutrient concentrations there. And then we can say, okay, it's underlain by this fossiliferous limestone and shaley limestone and shale, uh, just like the rest of the agricultural area is uh, in Chambers Creek. And say, okay, maybe the flushing mechanisms here are very similar to how they are in the rest of uh, the catchment. And that's why we're seeing um, really high uh, or relatively high concentrations of nitrate towards the outlet where the creek has already flown through a lot of agriculture. And that's it. Next, I'll be potentially developing a swamp model for coal farm in Shavers Creek. Uh, we're doing a synoptic sampling of the Shavers Creek watershed, and I'll continue sampling my Shavers Creek sites. Any questions? Um, well, so yeah, so we're thinking SWAT uh, just right now, just because it's a little, it's really easy to calibrate initially, just all you need is discharge. Um, PIM is sort of, uh, from what I've heard, PIM is sort of in the stage of, there's um, the, the deeper groundwater component isn't coupled with PIM, so there's no way to look at the deeper groundwater component, which SWAT doesn't do. But also, it seems like um, cycles, which would be the way that we look at agriculture in PIM, is also not quite integrated with PIM. I'm not really sure where that's at right now. Um, okay, yeah, so, um, so it is, but it's easier initially to just use uh, SWAT at this site, and then the, it's easier to upscale it short term to the rest of the Shaver Creek watershed as well. I just talked with Yu Ning and I could pass this back if you want, but Yu Ning has has now written a groundwater module that will go at the base of him so that we he you know he's almost got it ready to go where there's there can be an upper flow zone, an unsaturated zone and a lower sort of regional groundwater flow, which is what we think is happening at Shale Hills and probably at your site too. And so I was just asking him, you know, whether there might be some utility in having him, you know, run it for Shale Hills, like get it like working for Shale Hills and then maybe do a, like a simple simulation with you or for you of the coal farm site um, to help learn about it. And I think you should talk to him about that, like whether that might be a possibility because he was at least somewhat enthusiastic in my office. <laughs> Seems pretty enthusiastic. Um, I have another question. Um, have we gotten the information from the farmer about how much fertilizer he's putting in? Have we asked? That's all going through Brandon? Okay. Because I think we really need to keep pushing about that. Because I, you know, at least, I mean, I don't think we're going to do a full blown PIM model of the coal farm in your, you know, lifetime in the next year or whatever. But, you know, maybe an input-output kind of model, or if we knew how much nitrogen was going in, if we knew how much was coming out the spring, we might be able to learn something with, with the PIM model, which would be kind of fun. Um, but we got to get that data of what's going in at the top. So you're working on it. Okay. Right. We probably, he probably does, but we got to get that information. Did you want to say anything, Yuning, or somebody else? 
You sure? Brandon's working on getting the nitrogen data, yeah. Right, because I, I didn't think we wanted everybody pushing the farmer. We're kind of going through Brandon. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any other questions for um, Callum? Otherwise, going to share. <laughs>
as the update here, we actually test the difference between uh, a after adding a big boulder maps. Uh, in this last figure, the black dash line uh, represent the uh, case after adding big boulders. Uh, we can see the boulders, uh, big boulder. What happened there? But yeah, the 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 cost of the 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 boulder can improve the uh, soil mo prediction of soil moisture on the top layers uh, significantly, as you, you can see, no matter from the figure uh, or from the uh, uh, statistical value. And if we look at the uh, discharge, uh, uh, actually uh, the boulder will m actually drain the water faster uh, for a short time period. But if we look at the total amount around month. Uh, it seems the change didn't significantly. No. The blue is observed, the red is model without border, and the black dash line is the model with border. And if we, uh, this is even without calibration, the border can improve the soil moisture of the top layers. If we use the observations to calibrate the model, uh, we can estimate the soil properties of on, uh, uh, of two sides. You can see that this is the water retention curve. The Ghana run uh, site actually have a smaller um, porosity here. And if we look at the one water pressure head, the Ghana run seems to hold less uh, water compared with the shell hill. In the future, we will consider upgrade to upgrade the other figures. Yeah, if we don't calibrate the model, uh, we add the big boulder, it will increase the soil moisture at the top layer of the discharge. Yes. Hi, I'm Virginia Marcon. I'm a third year PhD working with Stu. And um, for today's little update, I'm interested in understanding where our soils in Garner Run are from. So for those people who are new here, Garner Run is um, underlying by this quartzite that's relatively insoluble. But we still have about a meter of soil that sits within in the with, along the groundhog site. So and then generally in these soil pits, we see that we have an enrichment of elements like aluminum, iron, and potassium relative to the rock chips that are found within those same soil pits. So the big question is, how do we determine what the source of the soil is? Can our Tuscora, this relatively insoluble quartzite, provide these elements to our watershed? And my really quick answer is probably not. Um, so what, what is providing these nutrients? Um, and so we have a couple of options. One could be the younger stratigraphy, so uh, Castanea and Rose Hill, which were strategic stratigraphically above the Tuscora or possibly duck. So to answer this question, as some people might remember from my all hands talk, I'm going to, or I'm starting to measure strontium 8786 on each of the sources to start to identify where our soils could be coming from. And it will be really tricky to identify where dust is coming from. So I'm going to try, possibly, to do some eudymium isotopes to try to hone in if we have dust co contributing to our watershed. Oh, yeah, I didn't do a very good job of explaining this. So the upper part is the soils, and the bottom part 
are the chips that are recovered from a long groundhog. So the upper are the soil from like Bleeding Ridge Ridge Top, and the bottom would be the rock chip Bleeding Ridge Ridge Top. Yeah, so the question was, can we use isotope data to identify the, if soils from the ridge top are now in the valley, right? Um, and so the quick answer is probably not um, specifically using strontium isotope, because what we're gonna see is an influence of, of different parent sources. So my guess is that, that's, that we won't be able to identify directly this movement downslope, maybe using other isotope systems or um, you know, your more and things like that. There is iron ore rock that we can Who's next? Yeah, so Warren Reed is a graduate student with Margo. He's a PhD student in second or third year. And uh, so Warren remeasured the, every uh, five years, we remeasure all the trees in Shale Hills. And, and Warren led that effort. And um, we found a bunch of dead trees and also a lot of recruitment into the, into the size that we were measuring. We measured it, 20 centimeters diameter trees and a lot of new trees came in. So they documented that. So we'll have an updated estimate of net primary productivity. And it seems to be lower. That's not such a question. It's lower than the, than the previous five-year interval. Yeah. Uh, and the dendrograms. He measures these dendrograms monthly. They came up before, but he just goes out and reads them. It's not a, a, a particular reduction. It's just measuring how much this band of metal moves. Um, and then we have these extra sites that Lily set up, five shale and five sandstone. The idea there is that just shale hills and just Garner Run maybe don't represent all shale and all sandstone sites. So we have five replicates of those. And he's coring trees to look at a 10 meter radius plot, something like that. He's coring trees and looking at um, uh, combining that with a climate record to see whether trees on sandstone or shale are more or less sensitive to precipitation variability and climate variability in the last probably 100 years of the field of climate change. They have this really great undergrad um, who has been archiving the litter. So if you need litter samples, he's archived litter from 2011, 2012, 2015, 2016. And then Garner Run, the message here is it's a weaker data set or a newer data set. We just have 200, 2015 data. But now we're measuring litter fall at the eight groundhog sites um, and we'll continue to do that at Garner Run and Shale Hills so we'll have a better Garner Run data set in the future. Yeah, litter trap people, the black gum is dropping leaves on them quite easily and that's why they're getting trapped. And fall 2018 they need help because they're going to remeasure all the 2,000 tagged trees and they're going to remeasure the trees in Garner Run so it's now 2,000 times two is three million. So really need, but I got, I got three, but okay. Then 
just going to measure measure how many. Uh, go look at the tags and see which trees died, and then we'll have some information what type of tree it is. So a group of Dave, Margo, and I, and some students met to talk about how we could use this uh, the slowdown event. Oh, you're going to talk about that. So I'm not going to. I'm going to let Dave talk about. That. Talk about what might be opportunities um, related to Roman's question. It, uh, what was the extent? So we were all interested in how much this represented. We saw a bunch in Shale Hills, and particularly a lot more just on the left side as you're going up the towards the tower. Just the, that whole uh, ravine got got wiped out. So, um, and uh, but we don't know how how much you could scale this to, to how in these forests, how much do these events likely contribute to uh, tree fall and particularly the tip ups that occur, not just from stem breakage, but when they, they blow over and, uh, and uh, the root system tips up. And so we talked about the, the possibility of reflying for, for LIDAR uh, because that, that's the only way we could uh, be thinking about in, in the uh, particularly in the footprint of the Eddy Flux Tower, because uh, the Eddy Flux Tower will have to have the before and after. And if we had some idea of the amount of stems down uh, based on previous LIDAR and a new flight, we would uh, be able to uh, assess to what extent this might be impacting uh, carbon flux, as well as how much. It's hard to, the foresters right now at, um, at the school forest really have no idea how many trees are down. It takes a lot of work to try to census that. Yeah, one or two. <laughs> and then uh, the second uh, question has to do with uh, what might be the potential uh, influence of all this woody debris. Now we have considerable woody debris in, uh, in the Shale Hills catchment as well as Right near the shales of catchment, and in some patches in Gardner Run, uh, and uh, and this would might be the opportunity for a long-term experiment because no one's going to complain if we cut logs from some of those down trees, and uh, and so what's indicated there was just some some initial thoughts on how we could set up an experiment using different wood types and looking at different mycorrhiza types that might uh, accelerate or decelerate uh, rates of wood decomposition. Uh, and then also uh, doing it in the common garden where environment is held constant and uh, we have the same tree species. And then uh, this could be done, say, in the renewal over the next five or six years each year, measure the rates of wood de decomposition as affected by uh, position on the catena tree species type, as well as looking at some of the, the, the players. Okay. We figure out how much it'll cost, and then that was a couple thousand. I wonder if we could probably come up like if we could pay half, if we could find somebody else, or you know, I mean, we could put in we exactly that might be like a really good idea. So, uh, Joan Marie and or some of our visitors, do you want to?
Yes, yeah, so my name is Ben Dillner. I'm um, a new master's student in ecology in, in Jason's lab. Um, and I'll just sort of introduce myself more generally because I don't really have um, like a specific hypothesis uh, quite yet. Um, so my, my background is I just finished my, uh, my undergrad in plant sciences at Cornell University. Um, so I have you know, a pretty strong background in botany. Um, and so in terms of what I'm doing at the CZO right now, I'm doing along with Chris Caitlin, um, we're in charge of like the routine uh, groundhog um, sampling measurements. Um, and then I guess um, I'm also going to be spearheading the uh, inventory of the blowdowns, um, probably recruiting some of you folks to help. Um, and then I guess I can I can mention some um, some ideas I have for um, questions I'd like to look at. Um, and and w one of those is looking at um, understory vegetation or uh, understory plant composition, um, and and kind of in the context of um, a bedrock. Uh, comparing between the, the you know the shale and the um, and the sandstone sites, and maybe linking that with like you know look, seeing if that can be an indicator for um, like forest productivity. Um, then I thought it might be interesting to look at um, invasive earthworms, um, so I guess there hasn't been much work done with that. Um, and then also kind of tying tying in with um, the recent blowdown event. Um, looking at the role of of gaps um, affecting forest productivity. Um, and that's basically all I have. So we're meeting next week, next Friday, um, and so we met with the all the all hands meeting in the spring. Uh, worked with students uh, to develop um, e trail guide, and so I think one thing we want to do is pick up that conversation again. And um, we need collective help to make sure uh, the information is accurate and cohesive and uh, a productive tool to kind of share with the public. Um, for that uh, trail, and yeah, Shavers Creek. Let's start at the beginning. I only have two minutes, though. Uh, Shavers Creek. We're just uh, we're you know so um, we're right here, right? No, yeah, right there. Um, and so we're Penn State's outdoor education field lab. So we're part of Penn State Outreach and Online Education. We've been around for about forty-one years. Um, and we are physically located in the old forestry lodge there at number seven on the map. And we teach about 35 classes for Penn, uh, Penn State, mostly undergrad classes in outdoor uh, interpretation, education, leadership. Um, and we have a nature center where people can come to. We have a raptor center, hawks, owls, eagles, turtles, snakes, birds, vultures, falcons, um, all sorts of local fauna uh, to come uh, check out. We're currently undergoing a $5.8 million renovation, though, so our visitor center is closed. But all the trails you see are still open, um, and so um, we've been very excited over the last couple years to, to partner with the CZO to try to make more connections. Um, we just had a meeting this morning. Um, we're, uh, as we open back up, we're looking at our interpretive dis displays in our exhibit room and how to, you know, what is our interpretive goal to kind of tell the story of the landscape, biodiversity, and then also um, to, part of that story is our partners um, here in the CZO and Rothbach, Great Forest, and beyond. And so that's part of our um, kind of internal discussions right now is we, we want to be able to, in our new uh, updated discovery room, uh, part of that is to tell the story of what the great research is going on right across the creek from us. 
Uh, last spring, we every spring we have a block of classes at Chambers Creek called the Seed Semester, Student Engagement and Experiential Discovery. Mostly Rec Park students, but also Ag Ed, ERM, a uh, variety of majors take that program with us. And one of the classes, uh, one of the five or six classes they take is an exhibit design class. And so uh, uh, one of our major projects this past spring was to develop an e-trail guide that a, a visitor could load onto an iPad and take with them on uh, the Mountain View Trail uh, and then this part of the Old Faithful Trail and back out and back um, to this loop, which kind of circumnavigates the CZO catchment area there. And the hope was that along the way there are stops that kind of tell parts of the story of, the, of ecology and the geology and um, the whole CZO picture. Um, so not actually in the catchment, but uh, kind of telling the story as you walk along it. Anything to add? I went on the e-trail guide with the, or I used the e-trail guide with the students for their final project presentation, and I was really impressed with the quality of the work that these students who weren't scientists, like, found on their own, did their own research, tried to put together activities, interactive activities, actually, there's, you know, like, matching things and drawing things on the e-trail guide, and so I was really impressed to see what the students had done, and I think it's a really good foundation for folks like us who do have the sort of factoids um, that we can contribute and sort of fact checking as well um, that the students put a lot of effort into and now we just have to sort of like help clean up you know and, and help tell the story a little bit better so I hope everybody might give a little bit of thought into this uh, project maybe this semester um, as we I guess work to make the base product even better part of that is maybe what's missing and if there's also some new efforts that are coming online if that uh, should be woven into the story as well our overall goal is to take the great science that's going on uh, and make it a little more accessible to the layperson, the visitor, so they can kind of uh, better understand that layer of what's going on there in the Stone Valley Forest. Yes. it up in terms of topic areas as best as the students can do that and so it might be that we have a set of well that's lots of better way that we can communicate if you guys have another area that we can make sure that we're saying the right thing Like I said, we had our first kind of uh, meeting this morning of the staff. I'm um, still very much in the planning phases of what our overall interpretive goal is, and then until it gets to meet of um, what are the what are the components of that. We can we'll have, we'll have more exhibit space to, in some ways. So we I'll talk about kind of technology we can in, infuse, whether it's screens to show the flux tower data and things like that. And so we continue those conversations this fall as well as we plan to. Uh, just so you know, our project is hopefully wrapping up this phase of it by late January, and so we won't really be opening again until the spring. So this fall will be a great time to start to go down the path of what the reality of um, some interpretive exhibits in, in our facility as well could be. So I know it's late, it's been a long time, but are there any questions anybody wants to ask like for the greater good of the group? I hope that worked out really well, actually. That is the weir, the outlet of Shavers Creek. Well, it was a couple years ago and it had been covered. And then when they took the cover off, the, there were those eggs. It's like our nest egg, this is our nest egg. Are there questions? Yeah, Jan, that that PowerPoint thing that we got to figure that out. Like, just yeah, that, yeah, right. Because there was a lot of animations, a lot of problems. We should test that ahead of time too. Of course, people get their slides to us really late, so these guys actually worked really hard. 
Yeah, there might be something that we can say. No, but uh, there was a lot of problems with the slides. You know, there, there, there was other glitches and all sorts of things. So, yeah, maybe we can play around with that. Are there any other points, more scientific or anything? I thought that was really good, everybody. All right, well, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll uh, be in touch, of course. Wait, what? Oh, are there thoughts on the speaker for the spring? I, I, no, I'm oh. No, typically the person that we invite each spring is dictated by where we want to be going, you know what I mean? Or what topic we haven't spoken about for a while. Um, so if you have a good thought about that, I think it'd be great. You know, we could have Danielle Repney here in the fall, and then we could